Hello class and welcome to chapter 10, Phenopunction Procedures, lecture part one. Today we'll be talking about different collection methods, basic steps we need to cover as far as collecting on a patient, patient identification, patient misidentification, hand hygiene, and how to prepare the patient for the procedure. And what should we carry in our tray? as far as equipment procedures or equipment procedures also. So the first thing we're going to talk about is basically our when we are collecting blood from a patient. There are different rules and criteria that we need to follow in blood collection that we must follow. First and foremost, before we even go up into a patient's room or if we choose to work outpatient, which outpatient means we travel to the patient themselves instead of in a hospital setting where we go up on the hospital floor and go into the patient's room. With outpatient, we have one or two ways. We go to the patient's house to draw the patient or the patient walks up to a specific lab that we are working in with their doctor's orders and we draw that patient. But first and foremost, before we do any of those things, we have to make sure that our area is prepped and ready to service a patient, be it in the hospital or outpatient setting. So if we are working in a hospital or inpatient service as a phlebotomist, the first thing we do when we clock onto the clock is we make sure that our equipment tray is ready to use for phlebotomy draws. So basically when we prep our tray, our phlebotomy tray, which is the tray we hold all our equipment that is needed to do a lab or venipuncture procedure, we have to first and foremost make sure that it is cleaned out, make sure it's fully stocked, that it has every appropriate tube, needle, syringe, alcohol, gauze, band-aids, tape, anything and everything we could possibly need to service the patients to the fullest, fullest and effective means possible. Next, we also have to make sure that we follow proper hand hygiene protocol. As you know, when we step into a patient's room, we wash our hands. When we step out of the patient's room, we wash our hands. If we cannot get to soap and water, we have to make sure that we have hand sanitizer with us at all times. Especially in this time that we're going through right now, hand hygiene is very much an effective role as far as not contaminating or not transferring any infections to another patient. So hand hygiene is far most, the most highly recommended thing we have right now. Sometimes you can wash your hands three times a day. Now some, I know I teach y'all to wash your hands and to put on gloves before you even touch a patient. That is proper protocol. That is the way I was taught and that is the way I'm teaching y'all. Now I know some of y'all have had lab work done at other places by other phlebotomists and you have seen them palpitate for a vein or have touched your person with just their bare hands and then they put on gloves. If this is the case, they're supposed to wash their hands before they even touch you with their naked hands and they're supposed to wash their hands again before they put on gloves and then they have to wash their hands after they take the gloves off. So that'll be three times they wash their hands, technically. But I tell y'all to wash your hands, put on your gloves, touch the patient, get your equipment together, and it's all in a sterile environment because you have the gloves on. Next thing we have to make sure we do is identify the patient. Patient identification is the most important thing in phlebotomy due to the fact, especially in South Louisiana, in the older generation, we have a lot of Mary Broussards or Mary Elizabeth Broussards. We have a, a lot of Elizabeth, Helen Thibodeau. It's common names that come up a lot, especially in South Louisiana that we have to make sure that we have proper patient identification. If you have a same name alert patient, 
The second way we have to identify that patient is by their date of birth. It is very rare and very, very rare that you have someone not only have the same first you know, the same first and last name, but also the same birthday. It does happen. It has happened to me once out of the 10 years I've been in the hospital. I just happen to have patients, same name, same last name, same middle name, same birthday. Then you have to go to another ways of identifying the patient is by their hospital ID badge. Because every patient is assigned a Pacific hospital ID number to differentiate, to make sure that you have the right patient. Another thing we have to do as we are talking to the patient and identifying the patient, we also have to introduce ourselves to the patient. We have to sound confident and knowing that we know what we're doing as far as us being a phlebotomist and collecting a venipuncture stick. We have to make that patient feel comfortable to make uh, comfortable enough for them to invade their personal space because we are in their space. We are pretty much in their personal perimeter space. So we have to introduce ourselves. We are always supposed to introduce ourselves with a smile, with a care. Uh, we never want to go in and introduce ourselves as if we're aggravated or agitated or grumpy, grouchy, sleepy whatever the case may be. We always want to have a smile to our face when we're introducing ourselves. When we introduce ourselves, we say who we are, what department we're from, and why are we there to the patient. Another thing is we're also going, while we're introducing ourselves, we are also assessing the patient. And when I say obsessing the patient, basically we're looking for telltale signs of what the patient's mood is like. How is the patient gonna react to us? What telltale signs are in their room that we're looking for? So when we're observing the patient or assessing the patient, we're seeing what kind of condition they're in. We're also looking for signs that are posted around the room. And certain signs we look across the room to say, sometimes we'll run across a room that says, do not do blood pressure or sticks on the left arm. That's assessing the patient because we're assessing not only the patient, but the room around, the room that the patient is in for signs. So you might see a sign above his bed saying, no sticks of blood pressure in the left arm. Well, that leaves the right arm. But guess what? As we're looking at the patient, we also notice there's an IV in their right arm. And the rule of thumb, when a patient has an IV in the arm, we can't draw on that side. So what is our next course? Uh, what is our next course? So that's what we mean when we assess the patient to see exactly what we can do or what is going on with this patient at that particular time when we are in the room assessing the patient or introducing ourselves to the patient, should I say. Once we get in the room, we also, as we are identifying ourselves, as we identify the patient to make sure that we have the correct patient that we are going to draw from, the other thing we're going to look at is what tests are being ordered and making sure we collect the proper tubes for that proper test. Because the one thing we don't ever want to do is have to recollect or redraw on this patient because then the patient starts to lose confidence in you as to say, do you really know what you're doing? Do you know your job? You just drew blood on me. What do you mean you need some more? And believe me, they will ask you all those questions. The second thing we have to do is make sure we gather the appropriate equipment for that patient. So during our assesses of the patient or while we're looking over the patient, we're also determining what type of veins they have also. Do they have frail veins? Do they have, as I like to call them, big pipes, big gigantic veins, uh, medium veins? What kind of veins they have determines on what type of equipment we'll use. We'll either use a evacuated tube system, we'll either use a butterfly, uh, system or we'll do a syringe method 
it just all depends on how the veins look and as we go further along in chapter 10 i'll explain those three different methods that i was talking about as far as the evacuated to the syringe and the butterfly method next thing we have to do is make sure that the patient is in the proper position we can't have the patient laying, especially when they're in a hospital bed, we can't have the patient laying on his stomach and expect to get a good adequate blood draw. We're not going to do it. We can't have the patient laying on their side because what if they tip over and we have a needle in their arm? What's going to happen? It's not a pretty exciting, not even to think about, much less to do. The other thing we have to do is proper application of the tourniquet. We don't want it too tight. We don't want it too loose. We want it just enough to where it'll slow slow down the blood flow. We're not trying to stop the blood flow. We're trying to slow it down to where we can get a return on blood. Next, after we place the tourniquet, we have to find a proper place to do a venipuncture. <clears throat> and to find a proper place to do a venipuncture, we do palpitation. And basically when we are palpitating for a vein, we take our index finger and we feel along the amicubical area of the arm, which is the middle part of your arm where your arm bends. We're looking in that area for a good valuable vein to draw from. And the reason why we palpitate is to see what direction is that vein going? Is it going at an angle? Is it going straight up and down? Is it going straight and then all of a sudden it curves to the left or is it going straight and curves to the right? We're trying to find out how the vein is traveling and how what direction is going in so that way when we do draw on that vein, we can pretty much hit it dead center on target. Once we have palpitated and located a vein, we're going to choose what size needle we're going to use. Are we going to use a regular syringe needle? Are we going to use a hypodermic needle with a syringe? Or are we going to use a butterfly? Just all depends on how the vein looks and how the vein feels. And we're going to make sure that we collect the appropriate tubes to go with the appropriate test. We have to make sure that all devices have a some type of safety mechanism. Now, different needles <clears throat> have different safety features. Some needles have to where when you go and draw on a patient, as you pull out, it retracts in automatically by the press of a button. As you're pulling the needle out of the patient, it automatically retracts into itself. And then there's some to where you have to cap it off yourself. Now, there's two ways of capping. The one in class, I teach y'all to depress with the thumb and up. Now, there is a safety collection cap to where you have to gently cap it on a hard surface, not on the patient's bed by no means. Um, no, you just don't do it on the patient's bed, on a hard surface just not on the patient's bed. <clears throat> Next, after we discarded and we safety cap all our equipment and we discarded anything that needed to be discarded, we have to label the specimen, the appropriate specimen. We never ever label anything out of the patient's view of sight. The patient wants to make sure that we have collected we are labeling the proper tube like this is my blood this is what you're labeling with my name so usually when i would label a patient's labs i would re-identify to make sure i am putting the correct label on the correct sample so i'm telling the patient so your name is john brown your date of birth is 11 27 66 and i'm as i'm labeling i'm retelling this patient who he is and he's saying nay or yay now i know some of y'all are saying what if he's unconscious what if he can't talk remember you have two identifiers verbal armband or the nurse nurses can come verify the patient for you if the patient is unconscious because sometimes the patient might suffer from edema in which edema is swelling and if their arms are swelling they're going to take the 
armband off because they don't want to cut off circulation by having the hospital band on. So they will cut it off and hang it on the bed. But remember, we can't always trust an armband that's hanging off of an arm rail because what if housekeeping might have mistakenly left it on and it was the previous patient? We can't trust that. So if we can't identify it by the hospital band, we call the nurse to make sure we can verify the patient that this is who this patient is, that you are certifying this is who this patient is, and you're telling me this is who this patient is. Now, if a nurse verifies who the patient is, we have to document. Everything has to be documented, documented, document, document. Document not only protects you, it protects you. <laughs> document everything because you don't want to get in trouble of saying you misidentified a patient when you did the two identifier methods because you asked the nurse and you looked on your requisition as she was telling you what was going on. So you get her to initial saying she verified this patient and you initial saying you got her to identify the patient on the requisition. Saves you both hassle. Always thank the patient for letting you do a blood collection because like I said before, we are in their personal space. They don't have to let you draw. And believe me, some patients will refuse. It's not because they don't like you or it's just because they might have thought you were rude. They just tired of being stuck. And sometimes they get stuck three and four times a day and they just tired. They don't want to be stuck no more. So they're going to refuse. So when you do get a patient who allows you to be in their personal space or who allows you to do a venipuncture, you always thank them after for allowing you to be in their space to do a blood collection. After you have finished labeling, putting the blood, putting the tubes in a biohazardous bag, along with properly labeled tubes, you're going to, once again, remove your gloves and wash your hands. And if you can't get to your, if you can't get to soap and water until you can, you're going to do hand sanitizer. I always kept a bottle of hand sanitizer in my tray, no matter what. I brought my own. All you have to do is just buy a little bitty bottle and then you can always refill it in the lab. Lab always has hand sanitizer, but it's just the big bottles and you can't carry that on your tray. It's too big. So when we're transporting blood, as we're collecting blood, there are different categories of transportation of blood or how we collect blood, should I say. We have our routine labs, which are labs that are done at any time, all the time. They're routine. Routine means they get done on a regular basis. There's something that's always done all the time on this patient. That's what we call routine. We get to it when we get to it, but long as it's covered within a certain amount of time, we can draw it. Then you have your time test. Time tests have to be drawn at that specific time. If it says labs need to be drawn at 10 o'clock, you have to be in that patient's room five minutes to 10. So at 10 o'clock, you are in the vein drawing blood at 10 o'clock. Then you have stat. Stat means now, at this moment, it's an emergency. They need now, the patient's critical. We need it, need it, need it, ASAP. Well, no, can't say that. We need it now. Like, draw it, label it, bring it down to the lab, get it tested, tell the tech it's a stat lab. So when it's finished centrifuging, he can get it out the centrifuge and run the test. Meaning that's how quick it is. It, pushes ahead of any other lab. Then you have one that's called ASAP. Now, I know another question is going to pop up. What's the difference between ASAP and STAT? Well, if you know the acronym of ASAP, it means as soon as possible. It's urgent, but not urgent as far as what a STAT is urgent. 
because the patient is in a critical condition. So meaning if you have an ASAP, you can wait pretty much until you get other labs that may be on that same floor of the patient. Say you have routine labs that you need to go draw. Well, you can go draw routine labs in this ASAP and bring it pretty much as down at the same time. Whereas if you have routine and you have a stat, your routine labs get put away to the side, you take care of the stat, stat lab, and you go back down to the lab like as soon as you finish drawing it. Whereas the ASAP, you can finish drawing the rest of the patients on that floor before you can go down and bring the blood to the lab. So that's the difference. One, you draw it, you bring it down to the lab to get tested. The other one, you can wait till you finish everything else and then bring it to the lab. When we're transporting it, different tests have to be carried a certain way. And they all have to be in a biohazard bag. That's a gimme. And basically a biohazard bag is to keep from contamination from transferring to patient to patient to all over the hospital. Because we do go into precautionary uh, patient room where they have an infection that is contagious. So we have to take proper protocol and bag it up in a biohazard bag. Sometimes we call it double bagging, where we put the tubes in one bag and then we put it in another bio bag. Not only that, certain tests have to be carried or transported in a certain way. Some tests you have to place on ice and some tests you have to protect from light. So we have to make sure we carry the specimen back to the lab in that appropriate order. If the test says protect from light, well, we have to fall wrap the tube before we put it in the biohazard bag to protect it from light. If it says place on ice, some hospitals have special containers we can put the tube in. That's kind of like a, a mini fridge for the tube, a ice pack, um, or should I say a mini ice pack for the tube. We just slip the tube in and we put it in the biohazard bag with that refrigerated tube and we ship it to the lab that way. Or if you're on the road, we literally have to have uh, some facilities have ice machines, so we fill up one bio bag full of ice and then we put the tube in a little pouch and wrap the ice around it and then we put it in another bag and ship, um, transport it that way. So there's different ways to put on ice that we have. When we are encountering the patient, we always have to be in a mental mature mind frame, meaning no matter how bad the circumstances of a patient is, we always have to be mature and mentally stable to handle any situation. And I mean any. Um, you might see someone who just had their arm amputated. You might see somebody who just had their leg amputated, their breast removed. You might see somebody severely burned and they look like a mummy. Um, you might see somebody who's been in, especially if you're working in the ED, you might see somebody who's been a fatal car crash and half their body is crushed. You might see somebody come in who's, have, who's on a drug overdose and they're convulsing and they're combative and you have to have a mature enough mind frame and the mentality to handle any situation. I've been across all of them in my teen years, all of them. I done seen a premature baby born and passed away. Not, yeah, did I wanna cry? Yes, but did I? No, not in front of the patient. Now I went outside and did it and composed myself. But as long as I'm in front of that patient, I performed professionally and did what I had to do. I've seen a patient, I was drawn on a patient, patient coded on me just flatline while I'm drawing. All I heard was the alarm going off, the crash cart coming in, nurses beating his chest and I'm still doing my job. I'm still drawing blood. <laughs> Cause why? That's what I do. So you run across different situations to where you have to be mentally ready to experience them and be prepared for them. They're all special circumstances. 
as you know, in the hospital, especially in a hospital setting, if we have to prep for a patient service, we have some patients that have to be contact precaution, meaning we have to wear PPE, which is protective personal equipment, the mask, the gown, the gloves, the whole nine yards. You look like Darth Vader. No, I'm joking. You don't look like Darth Vader, but you feel like it. But everybody should be used to it now because of what we're going through right now as far as the mask part of it. But some masks do have a shield and a face mask, um, the face guard on it and a shield for the eyes, some PPE equipment. So we have to be mindful what type of inpatient encounter are we gonna come across? Is this patient contact precaution? Or are we gonna have to wear PPE? If they're not contact precaution, we still have to follow the same hand hygiene. We still have to wash before we even go near the patient and we have to wash after we deal with the patient. That doesn't change. We also have to make sure we have the adequate equipment with us at all times when we are encountering a patient. Of course, we have to have a requisition. I usually carry two to three types of pins due to the fact that if I'm in a contact precaution room, I'm not gonna bring my pin back out because I'm not gonna wanna sanitize it to bring it out. So I have my good pin that stays in my tray because your tray does not go in a contamination room. You only bring the equipment that you need into a contamination room. You don't bring your whole tray because if you bring your whole tray, guess what happens? You're gonna walk all the way back to the lab and dump that whole tray out and restock because now you done contaminated everything that's in your tray. So you're only gonna carry what you need in a contamination room. The two proper tubes, the labels, and whatever, device you're gonna use for drawing. And yes, I brought syringe and whatever equipment you don't use, you trash, unless it's in a bag, in a plastic wrap, then you can be, okay. And this is all in a biohazard bag. So you're only pulling out what you need anyway. So I usually have my writing pen. I have my requisition or my labels. If I'm in the hospital, we have barcoded labels with the patient's information on it. And we're introducing ourselves, we're get, identifying the patient, and we are explaining what we're doing to that patient, or explaining to the patient why we are there. We always want to keep our area clean. That is the foremost and most important thing because clutter and contamination goes hand in hand. Because if it's clutter around in your work area, how do you know you're grabbing the right labels and how you know you're grabbing the right tubes and organization and clutter free and clean workspace makes an effective phlebotomist. Yes, you are carrying sometimes five or six patients different labels. Paper clip them together. Like this is Mr. Brown's test. This is Miss Suzanne's test. This is Miss Joellen's test. If they have more than one label, paper clip those labels together. Just don't stack them to all in one big clump sum and then you having to fish through to find what other tests did this patient have and that's when mistakes start to occur because then you have missed tests because you don't know where his other label is before you start your day put all labels together paper clip them together the same tests same patient different tests <clears throat> keep yourself clutter free and organized become OCD <laughs> Always carry yourself as a positive professional person. No matter how grouchy or how rude a patient gets, we do not go down to their level. They always say the sweeter your voice gets and the louder their voice gets just agitates them more, which is a true statement. The nicer you are to that patient, the more agitated they get and they 
eventually they'll mellow out because they'll say, okay, I'm not doing anything. I'm not making her mad. I'm, she's not hollering at me. She's not screaming. She is still the same even kill professional self. And it takes time. It takes patience. It takes perseverance. It takes a lot of being one with yourself to say, okay, he's being like this because he doesn't feel good. He really doesn't want to be here. He wants to go home. He doesn't want to be in this hospital. And he's just lashing out at anybody who comes into contact with you. And that's how you got to keep your professional positive self in control and not to have an outburst with the patient. Now, I'm not saying you have to physically take physical abuse. Now, if he's calling you anything but your right name, you have the right to walk away, not to confront, to walk away from a patient and not do their labs. But before you do that, you confront the nurse who's in charge of her patient and explain to her why you're refusing to draw on this patient. Because you'd rather not draw on this patient because sometimes you have a tendency to take your frustration out by the draw. And it's not something you would want to do intentionally. So before we do anything, we don't have to take physical abuse or verbal abuse. We can have that. We have the right to refuse. But before we even leave, we have to tell the nurse as to why we're not drawing this patient at this time. Always make sure if for some reason, sometimes, and it's very rare, but it does happen. We're human. And sometimes you can accidentally, even when I'm typing, I'll accidentally put in a diff, I'll put in a whole letter extra that doesn't belong there by accident because I'm typing and I type fast. So yeah, I accidentally put in a letter. So say if you have your patient requisition, requisition and it has Joe D. Brown. Remember, we have our two identifiers. We can have the hospital ID band, we can have a verbal, or we can have um, a family member or a nurse come and verify who the patient is. So his name is Joe D. Brown, but on his hospital ID, it says John, I'm sorry, it says Joe D. Brown. I'm saying the same thing again, I'm trying to get a difference here. So your requisition says Joe D. Brown. <coughs> but his hospital band says Joseph D. Brown. Now that sends up a red flag. Now don't get me wrong, yes. Some people who are named Joseph are sometimes called Joe. We know that's a nickname. We know this. But as far as HIPAA and as far as OSHA and as far as all the health codes and regulations that we have to follow, they're saying that's two different people in all aspects of the world, which is true. <coughs> which is so true because you got your requisition that says Joe D. Brown, but on the hospital band, it says Joseph D. Brown. But we know that Joe is a shortened form of Joseph. We know this, we know this, everybody knows this. But as far as laws and regulations that we have to follow in the hospital, as legal services, as far as legally, we cannot draw on this patient because the names don't match. Even though we know, mentally, Joe is the nickname for Joseph. So how do we fix this? How can we say, okay, this is the same person, even though 
the requisition says this and his hospital man says this how do we fix it well there's only one way to fix it we actually have to press the call button on the patient's bed and say who's the charge nurse who's in charge of joseph d brown yes we have to say what's on the hospital van a uh, joseph d brown i am well can you come into i'm so and so from the lab we have um can you come and verify some information for me never tell never tell the don't let it be known to the patient of what's going on basically so when the nurse comes into the room just step away from the patient and show her what the requisition says and what his hospital band says and she will either correct what the hospital what the lab say or say hey this is one of the same person okay if it's one of the same person i need you to initial stating that you said joe d brown and joseph d brown are one and the same person and again documentation 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 covers you <clears throat> also another thing as we're doing is we're correcting identification errors or not really errors but misinformation we also are looking to make sure that the patient is not had doesn't have any allergies believe it or not there's a rare case of patients who are allergic to alcohol like seriously they can't consume it they can't even rub it on them that's they have an allergic reaction to alcohol no matter in what form it is it's alcohol be it entertainment wise are rubbing alcohol they're just allergic to it so if we have a patient we are looking for allergies some are allergic to mostly almost everybody is allergic to some type of latex product so we have to make sure we're looking for signs for that not that anybody does you use latex anymore as far as the hospital say it in. um nothing is latex anymore um hardly ever one way to gain the co patient's confidence is always keeping the patient calm never leave your patient in dead air unless they're even when a patient is unconscious you can still talk to them there have been tests proven that even though somebody is unconscious they still know what's going on and i've had that proven to me because i had um i would draw on a patient who was unconscious for a whole week and then one day she was awake and she's like oh i know your voice you come in at such and such a time well she didn't know what time she said it seemed like you would always come in at around this time every day to draw my labs you're you have such a nice voice you know so it has been somewhat proven to me that yes they can still hear you even if you're unconscious and yes you still have to go to the formalities of introducing yourself what department you come from and what is the procedure you're doing on them yes you have to that's like if they're here if they're conscious you still have to perform and ask all those questions they just can't answer you and that's when you're obsessing everything else around their area to make sure what signs are around them in their bed because they can't tell you anything. When we're doing hand hygiene, we can either use soap and water, as you know, or like I said, hand sanitizer. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So one or the other, washing before we go to the patient and washing after we finish the procedure of the patient when we do wash our hands we have to make sure we get in between the fingers up to the wrist and for each and every patient we have to make sure we change our gloves out so that's a gimme for every patient we don't take put on and discard gloves for every patient we don't use the same pair of gloves for four or five different patients that's a gimme that's transferring infection from one patient to another another thing whenever we're working in the hospital is you can't have any artificial nails or extenders you can only have nails that reach no higher than the tips of your fingers themselves that's it so all y'all girls who love these long glorious fingernails 
if they're not all yours, you should clip them down to just you basically you're only going to see the teeny teeny tops of your nails that's it no more no less it's not wise to always use lotion even though yes i know what you're going to say we wash our hands so much our hands get dry yes i know i know i know we try not to use lotion because lotion can sometimes degrade the gloves because of what's in the lotion. If you need to lotion your hands, the hospital sometimes has a specialized lotion to where it's not greasy, it doesn't have any fragrance, sometimes it don't smell so good, but it's lotion. It does the job what it needs to do. But we try not to lotion so much because it makes it hard for us to put on the gloves. Even though we're supposed to wash our hands before anyway. But sometimes the hand sanitizer doesn't get all the lotion off either if we can't wash our hands with soap and water. So it's kind of like do's and don'ts. One, we're in an infection control patient's room. We have to always make sure that we protect ourselves and other patients as well. So to protect ourselves, we don on PPE. That's a gimme, which PPE is personal protection equipment. It's a gown, it's a face mask, depending on what type of uh, contact precaution they are. It's either a face mask or a face mask with a shield, or it's an N95 mask, which an N95 mask is a it's a tight sealed mask. It's so tight to where when you go to take it off, you actually have lines that show around your mouth where that mask was sitting. So we have different types of masks for different types of infectious control patients we have. Another thing is when we're doing the hand hygiene and the gloving technique is we don't want to transfer anything to another patient. That's why we have to always take precaution whenever we're doing labs. Also remember, just because we use gloves, that does not say we don't have to wash our hands. That is never the case. Even with gloves on, we still have to wash our hands. It's just common courtesy. When we put, before we put gloves on and after we take the gloves off, wash your hands. It's just a double layer of protection in all aspects. So when you're performing your hand washing, as you know, you're supposed to wash in between your fingers all the way up to your wrist. So if you have a watch, you all, we always tell anybody who has a watch that to make sure that they have a waterproof watch because you are washing all the way up to you, up to your wrist. I mean, you're covering up your wrist knuckle. You're washing all the way up to there. And of course, for every patient, you always put on a new pair of gloves. That's just a given fact. That's just common courtesy. That's just gross. If you don't change your gloves, then why would you not want to change your gloves in between patients? <clears throat> if we can't get to soap and water, hand sanitizer works just the same. Hand sanitizer before and after you do your patient procedure. So, when your hands are completely dry or the hand sanitizer and don't fling your hands in the open air, that's redepositing contaminants, just like we don't fan to get the alcohol dry on the patient. We don't fan our hands in the air, like we just don't care. Because we're, guess what you're going to have to do? Rewash or re-sanitize your hands. Because now you done blew all the contamination back on your hands again. So once your hands are properly dried, then you can slip on your gloves. Try to fit the gloves as tight as you can on your fingers. If you still have some bagginess or some looseness in your gloves, that means your gloves are too big. Now, I know some of y'all, some, some people are, they're not a small, they're not, a, they're not a small, 
or should I say they're not extra small, but they're not small, they're in between. Well, usually you want to go with the extra small anyway. You're just going to have to take a little longer to put the gloves on because the small are too big because you have too much play. So when you have too much play in your gloves, it makes it hard for you to tie the tourniquet because every time you tie the tourniquet, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose the glove in the tourniquet. Your finger's going to get stuck in that tourniquet every time. The fingertip and then guess what else happens when you go to pull it out it's going to make the tourniquet roll and you might lose the tip of your glove so now you got to put on a new pair of gloves you got to start all over again so there's different aspects of it now when we go to take off our gloves after we deal with a patient we always take off by pulling the bottom layer up removing that one glove balling that glove off into the hand and going underneath the other glove and pulling up. And it's putting the gloves inside out of each other, meaning you're putting one discarded glove inside the other one and turning the other one inside out to keep the contamination inside the glove instead of outside the glove. And you can wrap any biohazardous material that way in your one glove to keep it all in one area. Also, once we have removed the gloves, the contaminated gloves, of course, once again, we are going to wash our hands. That's a give me or hand sanitize if you can't get to soap and water. The whole purpose of hand hygiene is to get rid of microbes or antimicrobes that might be attached to your hands. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean our hands aren't dirty. Any little thing we touch all the time, anything we do, any air, you would cough in our hands, we're not supposed to. Sometimes we mistakenly cough in our hands, accidentally sneeze in our hands, we touch something that somebody else touched, we might have sneezed or coughed in their hand. You know, there are certain things we don't know. Our hands may not look dirty, but they are dirty. And you're supposed to wash your hands before you eat, after you finish eating, when you come out the restroom, you're supposed to wash your hands with soap and water so just because you don't see dirt doesn't mean they're dirty <clears throat> another thing as far as when we are for bottomless the biggest thing besides hand hygiene that we have to worry about is needle stick precaution <laughs> excuse me needle stick precaution so basically what needle stick precaution is different ways of handling how we handle the discard or the use of needles as you know we have different types of needles we have the evacuated tube or eclipse system of a needle we have the butterfly needle or the wing infusion set and then we have a hypodermic needle, which you use with a syringe. Those are the three methods we use to do venipunctures. <clears throat> as far as recapping a needle, most Eclipse have a set, some type of safety device attached to it to where we can cap it off. Same thing with a butterfly needle. It has either, some butterflies have the retractable needle to where when you pull it out, you depress a button and it retracts in. So you don't have to worry about sticking. There are some butterflies to where you, put your, you pull up on your safety device and it closes off the needle in a safety device when you hear it click. And then as far as your syringe method, which uses a hypodermic uh, needle, that is the only one that doesn't come with some type of safety device. Um, but it has, sometimes we do have to recap the needle in order to do a transfer device. Now, we never, ever, ever, never really are supposed to recap a needle due to high risk of a needle stick, a hazardous needle stick. 
But when we have to transfer a syringe to a evacuated tube, we have to recap that needle in order to take that needle off in order to put a transfer device onto it. It's just there's a safe way to do it and there's not a safe way to do it. We always have to make sure that we follow protocol and procedures when we're dealing with needles. That's a gimme. We always have to make sure we put needles in their proper sharps container. Sharps go in the sharps, biohazard goes in the biohazard waste. You never put sharps in a biohazard trash can and you never put biohazards in the sharps container. The two, to, the two shall never meet in the same area. It's one for one, one for the other. Sharps are usually hung on the wall or it's a little mini sharps that you carry on your tray. Just all depends on what type of thing your facility has. And never ever stick your hand in the sharps because you never know when there's an exposed needle. Always make sure that you use safety above all else. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of what's going on in that sharps container. Don't just go ahead and dump your needle in and guess what? There's an exposed needle just sitting there waiting at you for you to go ahead and dump your needle in without looking. And guess what happens? Poing! You stick yourself. So always be mindful and aware of what you're doing when you're around the sharps container. The reason why we always have to have a hepatitis B vaccine is because we have a high risk of catching it. So we always have the hepatitis B vaccine done on us to make sure we have titers. So before you get employed, they will run a titer on you to see if you are up to date on your hepatitis B shots. And if you're not, they'll schedule a series of tests and hep B has a series of three shots at different intervals that they'll give to you from the hospital. Always, if you do happen to get a needle stick or any type of injury, it doesn't necessarily always have to be just a needle stick. You could have fell down, walk into a patient's room. Make sure you always report any and all injuries at a timely manner. If it is a needle stick precaution, make sure you wash and sanitize your hand. Make sure you collect the patient's information and everything that is necessary to fill out a report and report it immediately, 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 immediately. When we are having to do precautions as we always do, especially to prevent needle stick, needle sticks hazards, make sure we always select a needle that has some kind of safety feature on it that we can utilize. Make sure we always avoid as much as possible of recapping needles. Cause like I said, there is a safer way to, or no, that's not right. There is a safe way and there's a non-safe way of recapping a syringe, but neither way is appropriate way because you still run across a chance of you possibly getting a needle stick if not done correctly, correctly, correct. If you're not paying attention, should I say. All right. So when we enter into a patient's room, when we're approaching a patient and assessing them and identifying, always remember common courtesy is always to knock first. I'm not saying knock like you to popo. Yes, have a firm knock, but not a bang to where the whole hospital floor can hear you coming at this patient's room. A nice firm three knocks and open the door or wait for them to say come in 
and you as you are entering into the patient's room you are introducing yourself now another thing is it you have shifts you work in the hospital and if you have early morning shifts which early morning shifts start at four o'clock in the morning so at four o'clock in the morning most people are sleeping so when you're knocking on the door not you're not necessarily going to hear a come in and you're not necessarily going to have somebody who's coherent or whose lights are on in their room already because it's midday it's early in the morning it's still sleeping hours technically because it's four in the morning but to you it's early morning and it's time to get up and it's time to do laps <laughs> but to them it's still nighttime and it's still sleepy time so if you do happen to go in a patient's room and the lights are off please don't turn on the high beam lights be courteous i mean you're going to start at a patient you turn on the big beaker high beam lights first thing walking in turn on a low voltage light first tell the patient who you are why you are there that way you can tell them to watch their eyes or to close their eyes while you turn on a brighter light so you can have a look at the veins in their arm and they'll understand that they versus you turning on that big bright light first thing when you walk in because now you got them blinking and now you done agitated them so how are you going to get a good vibe from them you're not they're going to be agitated and they're not going to let you draw because you just agitated them and they're going to tell you to get out and it's four o'clock in the morning they love saying that it's four in the morning get out i'm not doing morning run so it's better to be cautious and courteous to the patient make sure you set up make sure you explain the procedure to the patient make sure you uh, if the patient asks what type of labs you're doing if it's them by themselves we can tell if it's them with a guess and their guess is all ears which most guests are we cannot disclose what tests are being drawn but we can say if you would like to know what tests are being drawn on you today or what tests have been ordered on you today you are more than welcome to ask when the doctor or the nurse comes in your room to check on you and then there'll be their option if they want to tell them what tests were drawn on them today it's just a precaution when we're assessing the patient if labs are supposed to be fasting we have to especially in an inpatient in an inpatient setting we don't really have to worry about this too too much unless the patient is a diabetic and then sometimes the pay if a diabetic patient does get a midnight snack in the hospital sometimes not all the time I'm not saying all the time but sometimes so their fasting schedule has been off because of that midnight snack but if we're drawing somebody in an outpatient situation and we're assessing the physical disposition uh, of the patient we have to make sure we know when was the last time they exercised did they recently drink alcohol what type of, when are you following some type of strict diet did you smoke before you come here um sometimes the patient will tell you themselves if they have a tendency to faint or not believe me oh i'm a fainter you may want to be careful they have no qualms in telling you this at all and then some try to hide it but not all the time latex sensitivity we really don't have to worry too too much on this anymore because like i said most of the things no not most almost all the things now in the hospital are pretty much non-latex so we really don't have to worry about that as much uh, stress age arm preference yes if the patient is an experienced person who has done labs before oh believe me he knows his body better than we do he can tell you what arm to draw from listen to the patient the patient knows which arm is the better arm because it's their body they know they've been through labs before they already know what's going on 
There it is. And the reason why sometimes we collect the weight of the person or the patient is because some tests are calculated against their how much the patient weighs. So. Also, some factors we have to consider as far as analyzing or during the analytical phase of doing a venipuncture on a patient is we have to consider their age, their gender, what type of diet they have, and what exercise they're doing, what blood type they have, what's going on with the patient. Are they chewing gum? If they're not supposed to chew gum, if we're doing a glucose tolerance test, are we doing a glucose test? Uh, and they're sitting there smacking on gum, what's the purpose of doing it? You don't put sugar in your system. Even though they may say sugar-free, saccharin is still comes kind of sweetener. We also have to analyze what type of medicine they have, they've been on. Are they on blood thinners? Do they take a baby aspirin every day? Do we have to know what kind of medicine. If they're in the hospital, what side of their IV is on? We have to know which side is the good side, which side is the bad side. Um, sometimes we have to notate that if a patient is on their menstrual cycle or if they're pregnant, are they going through menopause? Because guess what? At that particular time, if we're drawing electrolytes on a person or we're drawing an iron level on a person, their iron levels are going to be off kilter because of these factors. If a person is experiencing emotional stress or they have some type of needle phobia, we usually say a white coat syndrome. White coat syndrome is basically anybody who's afraid of a hospital setting in itself. It's not necessarily if they see somebody in a white coat, because you know, most doctors wear a white coat. No, it's just a hospital setting in itself that they are scared of. they're scared of anytime they're in a hospital just period it's nothing to do with the whole wearing a white coat or whatever so uh, we just call it the white coat syndrome because it has something to do with the hospital or the setting of their environment or they might have some psychiatric disability when you work out patients, sometimes we do go to psych wards to draw on patients, um, but we also have an attendant that's there to help us if the patient becomes combative or unruly to the phlebotomist itself. So we always have somebody with us, but it's just the idea we have to assess that patient to make sure uh, as far as the psychiatric habilitation. So when, after we have introduced ourselves, after we have assessed the patient, we have to identify the patient by looking at the test requisition because we have to have a test requisition. Without a test requisition, we can't draw on a patient. We're not drawing a patient, a blind patient, without knowing what tests we need to draw. It's just a gimme. So patient identification, we have to use the two identifiers in order to identify a patient. We have to do verbal, hospital band, hospital band, family member, hospital band, nurse, as long as it's two different ways we are identifying the patient and that the patient's name and birthday and hospital ID matches what is on the requisition or the label itself. Meaning all uh, on the requisition, you're not only gonna have the patient's ID, his name, first name, I, first and last name, date of birth. You're also gonna have his gender. You're gonna have what type of test he is gonna have and what form the test was ordered in or what status. Is it a time test? Is it a stat test? Is it an ASAP test? Is it certain? Is it a fasting test? Is it what type of tests is being run on this patient. So all this is on the test requisition. 
Also, sometimes, not all the time, I have never seen this on a requisition. Um, they'll let you know if the patient is latex sensitive. I've never seen it on air because like I said, most places don't have latex around anymore anyway. Um, clinical information as far as what clinic ordered this or what physician ordered this, what type of specimen do we need? Is it a urine test? Are we collecting urine? Are we collecting stool? Or, and stool is um, number two, should I say? Stool, number two, fecal matter. All that's the medical terminology for number two. Um, when they say source of specimen, um, sometimes they may want serum and uh, they want plasma instead of serum. And what we mean by serum and plasma is the color, different color tube we're going to draw, which in chapter eight, we're going to differentiate that a little more in depth. And I'll explain even further the difference between serum and plasma. I just don't want to overload you at this point. Just know that at this particular time, there are, they mean two different things as far as the source of specimen collection. Depending on outpatient services, we do have um, billing information so we can uh, bill the patient appropriately according to the test that we are drawing from. And of course, we have to have some type of diagnostic, diagnostic code. And of course, the physician ordering physician's signature. We cannot draw without a physician's signature. And believe me, physicians aren't signing it, the nurse is stamping it. Psh. But we have to have the stamp of approval before we can draw. So either way it goes, we still have to have a physician's signature <clears throat> and diagnosis, diagnostic codes for us in order to build the patient properly. Do we code as phlebotomists? No, we do not. We cannot self-code a patient as a phlebotomist. Nope. If there is no code on that requisition, guess what you are doing? You are do, 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 do. Hello, Dr. So and Show. I need diagnostic codes on patient so and so, data burst so and so and so. His labs are this, 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 and this. What is his diagnostic code? We have to attain them. We cannot self diagnose a patient. Because why? We're phlebotomists. We're not doctors. We're not nurses. We don't know. We just draw. We're also looking on the test requisition to make sure nothing is duplicated because sometimes the doctor check off a test and then he'll forget he'll, he checked it off. He'll then again write it towards the bottom of the requisition, pretty much the same test. So we just double check to make sure there's no discrepancies, there's no duplication, that there's no missing information. So before we draw, we double check. We don't want no mistakes. Sometimes, as far as in-house or in-house, inpatient or in the hospital, we have what we call a zebra printer. And on this zebra printer, it prints out barcoded labels for us to use to label our specimens. And this is like a requisition form on a patient. It's just labels that are on a barcoded tab that we can use to label the patient's specimens. When we are in identifying a patient, the reason why we identify a patient is not only to protect ourselves, but it's also to protect the patient, and it's also to keep us from getting any legal ramifications for misidentifying a patient. Due to the hazards that can be caused by misidentifying a patient, is the reason why we have the two identifiers is if we mis we misidentify a patient, that patient receives treatment that was not meant for them, and then other complications come into play. Is the reason why we always are extremely careful when we are identifying patients when we are doing laboratory tests. As we know, we greet the patient. We identify ourselves, we introduce ourselves to the patient, we identify who they are, 
why we are there and we always wait for some kind of gesture to say okay you can come all the way in for them to say okay you can come in and draw my laps so we introduce ourselves we tell them what, where we're from we of course first and foremost greet the patient we've got to say hello good morning hello good afternoon how good evening something we just don't go hey and we definitely don't barge in the patient's room we knock on the door and ask if it's okay to go into the patient's room then we tell them why we're here and what we're doing here and then we wait for the patient to make some kind of gesture to say okay you can come all the way into the room we ask the appropriate questions have you been fasting when was the last time you ate are you any on type of blood thinners are you on any type of medicine do you have a tendency to faint which arm do you prefer because like i said the patient pretty much knows his body better than we do they know what side to draw from and of course if they have an iv in one side we already got that eliminated for us anyway because we can't draw from the same side as an iv and we also looked for any signs to tell us that, hey, we can't stick in the left arm or, hey, we can't stick in the right arm. So we look for the telltale signs of where we can draw from. It is our responsibility. No, 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 not just our responsibility. It is our obligation to make sure we identify the patient correctly. This is like the critical point in our job this will make or break our career is identification mix-ups in patients I'm, I'm being serious this is like you have to be on your a plus 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 game when we are identifying patients we can't be off in never never land and our mind is somewhere else and wondering and we are asking a patient who they are and we're not we're not paying attention and then we put the label down and then we go to pick it up and we label it with the wrong patient's label because why we're not paying that we're not paying attention of what we're doing that is like the strictest no 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 we always constantly we have to be aware of who we're drawing what is the patient name double checking the patient identification by re saying the patient's first name last name date of birth making sure as we're sticking the labels on the tube itself that is like first and foremost but another good thing is we're always the first ones to catch any possible mistakes also in the patient's identification so it's like a two-edged sword it can make us or break us. The reason why we have to follow the do to identify our method is because a joint commission. Joint commission came up with this policy to kind of help eliminate misidentification of patients or mis yeah a misidentification of patients because then you have the two identifiers saying okay you have the test requisition you have the patient's verbal you have the patient's hospital band if all three of those match we got a good chance that this is this person but like i said in south louisiana we can have everybody match the same first and last name it's down to a birthday so sometimes and in some rare occasion it's down to the patient's hospital id number so we have different aspects we have to look for as far as south louisiana we are a rare case hey we're a rare state so you have to take the good with the bad <clears throat> so when we are identifying patients we have to make sure that we know the location of course if we're working in the hospital is inpatient come on give me if we're doing outpatient lab service if we're doing an ed or er as some people would know it but now it's called ed emergency department instead of er emergency room because it's more than one room so they say ed because it's a department it's more than one room we have to also make sure we know what type of patient it is is it an adult 
Is it an infant? Is it a pediatric? We have to know if the patient's conscious or unconscious. Uh, does the patient have an armband? This is all things we have to consider. Because like I said, if a patient is edemic in the arms, they're not going to stick the hospital band on the arms. They're going to take it off because they don't want it to cut off the blood circulation on the arm. So armband is gone. Those patients who are inpatient will usually most likely receive, if they went through the ED, is they'll receive their armband once they're in the ED. And then they'll go up to the floor. And it's supposed to have the patient's last name, first name, date of birth, and a unique hospital ID attached to it. When it's outpatient or ambulatory, things are a little different. Not necessarily we have, as far as outpatient, are they going to have an armband? They're outpatient. There is an in-out situation. They're not always going to have an armband. So how do we identify patients who are outpatients? Well, we have to, first and foremost, get their ID meaning their driver's license or ID or some type of picture ID form to verify who they are, some photo ID to verify who they are along with their requisition. And also nine out of 10, if they're outpatient lab, we also have to acquire their insurance cards at that time too. So we can update, so we can bill, bill the patient for the lab services. <clears throat> and that's for patients who, that's how we identify patients who are outpatient. What if a patient is in a coma? How do we identify it? They can't talk to us. They're unconscious. They're, well, and then you have some that are semi-conscious. Are they just sleeping? Well, if a patient is sleeping, we gently shake them. We don't say, hey! Wait up! No, we don't scream at them. What if they're a cardiac patient? What if they just had a stroke and we going in there screaming at them and shaking them like they, like they your brother or sister or your child? No, we can't do that. We have to gently nudge them and say hello in a soft, even kill voice. Hello, are you awake? Are you awake? Can you wake up for me? Hi. Yeah. That way we can get them to communicate who they are. Is to wake them up. If they're semi-conscious, meaning they're going in and out, there's there's no communication there. They're in one minute, out the next. They're, you don't know when they're going to be in and when they're going to be out. So usually we just use the armband as an identifier and the nurse to help identify the patient. When they're completely, totally in a coma, a comatose, nurse and hospital man, that's all we have, along with the requisition, because remember all three have to match. So that's how we do it. Now for babies and children, we have to ask the parent to identify. Or if the parent's not available, we have to ask the nurse to verify who they are. Because verbally, how many one-year-olds can actually say their whole first and last name? It's very rare. Much less an 18-month-old. Or 12-month-old. 12-month-olds are still talking like babies. Well, 12-month-old is a year old. How many year-olds know their first and last name? How many... Nine month olds can talk, they can't. So that's when we have to rely on a family member or the nurse to identify the patient and tell us who they are and making sure they give us the right, correct first and last name. And especially if it's an outpatient situation, we have to make sure the demographics all fit into play. When it's an emergency situation, especially if somebody is coming in from a car accident or they're coming off of a cardiac arrest, they don't necessarily have time to do a proper, proper paperwork, should I say. Everything is kind of like the rush order. So what usually happens is the ED will assign a temporary ID, patient ID. 
on that patient. They might not have the whole correct name or what if that person comes in and they don't have any type of identification at all. No driver's license, no wallet, no nothing, no purse, no nothing. They just came straight to the street, from the street to the hospital. Well, the pa excuse me, the hospital will come up with a temporary ID and name until they can properly identify that patient. So you'll have, um, they'll say John Doe, or if it's female, they'll say Jane Doe, and they'll give them, them a temporary ID name or a temporary hospital number and temporary name until they can find proper identification. That way they can still provide service to that patient. So that is a temporary number. Now, once they acquire the full and correct name, date of birth and everything else, they'll merge the two documents together based off of the temporary. The temporary hospital number will now become their permanent hospital number with the correct information as far as their name, last name, first name and date of birth. That's an emergency situation. When a patient comes in who has been severely burned, I was not there in the ED when the Exxon Valdez blew up and all those burned patients were coming in um, and they were coming in from everywhere. They were going from New Orleans to Lafayette, to Lourdes, to Lafayette General, to Crowley, to all hospitals that can book them. That's just how many people they had. So they were coming from New Orleans all the way down to Lafayette, and I think maybe even Shreveport might have got a few of these cases. I'm not 100 for sure, percent sure, but I know Lawrence did, and I had just clocked off when all this went down. So when a patient comes in that is severely burned, you're not going to put anything on. A matter of fact, you're trying to take everything off as carefully and quickly as possible so they don't get an infection. That's what you're doing, or at least that's what the doctors are doing. You're just there to collect blood. But how do we collect blood on a patient that we have no identification on? There again, like I said, um, when they are severely burned like that, they can't put necessarily put anything on them, much less an armband. So basically their armband is on their bed and usually burn units, they are very cautious about having anything on the bed. So if you're in doubt and you don't feel comfortable by looking on the bed label, and it's a tag, and it's an individual tag, it's not like an armband that they tape on the, on the bed rail. No, it's a tag that has the hospital identification number, everything on it, on this patient. <clears throat> but if you don't feel like you can't trust that or you don't feel comfortable using that, you can always call the nurse to identify the patient. So, and it also depends on how your burn unit works also. So there's always a gimme or a catch behind all of it also. High risk situations. Um, we consider what high risk is, is if you have siblings, especially twins, triplets, quadruplets, they all look alike and sometimes they have rhyming names. So we have to be extremely careful of which twin or which triplet or which sibling we are drawing on at that particular time. Newborn babies, all newborn babies kind of look alike when they first come out. So it kind of makes it a little hard and they don't really have a first and last name. Not, not technically. On a newborn's band, it'll have baby boy in the mama's last name. So it's kind of like baby boy Nelson. Like, hmm, who? Okay. How many baby boy Nelsons are there? So we have to be, and if they're, God forbid, they're all supposed to be born the same day if they're in the, in the nursery. So how do we tell which baby boy Nelson is the right baby boy Nelson you need? We have to look at the hospital identification number. They tell us. So 
Some errors we always try to avoid is an inadequate requisition form. That's why we always have to look at our requisition forms before we even go up to the patient to draw. <clears throat> if there's a mix up in some paperwork, meaning somehow or another, Joe Lewis's labs got mixed up with Edna Thibodeau's labs, it happens. They might have forgot to tear that label off. It happens. So we always have to be mindful of what labels we're sticking on something. Making sure we follow proper identification protocol. Don't be in such a hurry that you take shortcuts. Patient identification has no shortcuts. It is what it is for your safety. It is what it is for the patient's safety. And it is what it is to protect yourself and keep your license or your certification, should I say. Due to why patient identification is the way it is, is to prevent the wrong patient from getting or going into some type of life-threatening occurrence. That's why we always have to be mindful of proper identification. We don't want to mislabel the blood with somebody else's label and they receive treatment that they shouldn't have received. And then that causes more problems that can be life threatening because they received the treatment that their body was not needing. And you just have your body is no longer in homostasis, meaning it's not in a stable state of mind. It is all trying to get back into balance and it doesn't know how because it's got this foreign entity that's going on and it's not it didn't ask for it so what is going to happen is eventually the body is going to go poop, it's going to shut down because it doesn't know how to fix it because there is nothing wrong in the first place so Another thing is that it keeps you from getting any legal actions or ramifications or lawsuits formed against you for mis misidentifying the patient. Both you and your employer at the same time can possibly avoid lawsuits or can get lawsuits for misidentification of patients. So that's why identification of patients is very, 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 very much important. And of course, misidentification of a patient, that's an automatic termination. No write-up, no retraining, no nothing. Automatically, pink slip, out the door. Bye-bye, sayonara. And possibility of losing your certification because believe it or not, all hospitals talk. It's hard, it'll be hard to get another phlebotomy job somewhere else if you have a misidentification error that causes you to get fired because all hospitals talk all and it's called blackball you're blackball meaning you pretty much have to go out of state and then you still have maybe a 30 50 chance and this concludes chapter 10 lecture part one for today I will be doing chapter 10 lecture part two very soon. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and have a nice day. Bye.